another episode, another interesting discussion, and another great guest. It's well known that data is very important for any industry, and especially for the aviation industry. That's why today we have a guest who, is, who calls himself a data junkie, an avgeek, an expert in the aviation industry, Mr. Thomas Yeager. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning. Thomas is the founder, CEO, and owner of CH Aviation. And uh, he's uh, well known all over the world for the data and the information he provides to the aviation and the airline industry. Earlier in his career, he was responsible for product management and development for various companies, including Radix, TIK Systems, and Mercator. 20 years ago, he was also in charge of marketing and sales for various aircraft operators in Europe, which includes uh, Intersky Lufthard and later EU Jet. Thomas is from Switzerland and he's a graduate in business administration from uh, St. Gallen University. Thank you for joining me today, Thomas. Thanks a lot for having me. So knowing you personally, having met you in conferences, in exhibitions, and anyone else who know you, we can see clearly your passion and your love for the aviation industry. Actually, it's uh, infectious. We can see it clearly. So where did this passion come from? I think it started at a very early age from what I from what I'm being told when I was two years old, I knew all of the bus lines in my hometown by heart. And it just started from uh, being terribly interested in public transport to then being interested in railways. And then after the first flight that I've taken, which was, a, I think, an MD-81 from Swiss Air that I flew from Zurich to Madrid. Then I switched from railways to airplanes. But in, until today, you could have conversations to me about public transport and everywhere I go, I'm, I'm really interested in stuff like that as well. So it's it's just some kind of a transport geekiness that with aviation sticking at the end. So from two years old? Yeah. Wow, that's very impressive. So CH Aviation was your first project in the aviation? Uh, yes, I mean, I, st I started that when I was in high school because I was essentially bored. So I, I started CS Aviation really as a hobby project and it was no different from, I guess, many other people that started a little aviation website as a hobby project for fun. Um, so the fun part of that story is that back then when I started, I actually didn't have internet at home yet. So I was really literally running it from the the School computer up. room, as it was called at school. So it was just something I was doing after after school, uh, go to the computer room, write an article about aviation for an hour. Um, but I mean, many other people start that way, but it, it's just something that I obviously kept on doing throughout my professional career. And then at some point I just decided to give it a try and see if, if I could actually live from it. And uh, I guess I can. So. I think this is very inspiring to any student who might be listening to us that school projects should be taken seriously and a school project can actually become a big business and they can make living out of it. Yes. Uh, I, I think we should start promoting the podcast uh, for aviation lovers who are still in the schools. No, I think it's in, in general, I think it's just some, the saying that patience pays well. And I think if you just keep on doing what you like doing and then uh, have the persistence to see it through, I think you can make anything happen that you would like to make happen. So uh, I think Absolutely. it's just a question of, 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 of how much patience you actually have. Absolutely. And what about the name, CH Aviation? Uh, why did you choose it? What does it refer to? Well, that's a bit of an accident, really. I mean, back then... Uh, I, I just had to pick a name because you have to pick a name for a website and I wanted to call it Swiss Aviation first because I wanted to write about aviation in Switzerland, but that name was already taken on Geo Cities, which back then was kind of the hippest thing on how to set up websites for yourself. It's maybe a bit similar to what Wix.com is today, how to get a website set up real fast without knowing anything. Um, so I just had to pick a different name because the one I wanted was already taken and CH is the, the ISO country code for Switzerland. So 
So that's where the pH comes from. Yeah, it actually, was more of an accident than a, a smart branding choice. But you know, once the name sticks, it's not the smartest to then rename yourself into some other weird name no one knows about. And and uh, but I think it's just the name that people know us by now, and that's what it is. I think there is two schools here. Sometimes a great name can help a business grow a lot. At the same time, normal names can become great by great people starting them. Yeah. So I, the... I, I don't. I don't think if we would have a, a, a fancy different name, it would make a significant difference. Especially yes. since we're in the in the B two B business as well. It's not like we are trying to uh, get a massive audience in B two C space. It might be different. I understand. So what's the current situation of CH Aviation? What, uh, where, where are you taking the company? How do you see the future? Well, I mean, we have grown quite rapidly for over the last couple of years. We, we are somewhere around 42 people right now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we, we have planned to double that in the relatively near future. We haven't invested very much during COVID because we obviously uh, also have been hit um, with, with some issues, especially in the first couple months of COVID. Um, so we have been very, I would say, cautious the last year and a half, but we are planning to make quite a significant investment again now. Um, I think what we really want to, to become is, is kind of the, the market leader in this entire uh, airline industry data space. And again, it's a patience game and something that will obviously take a couple of years because we are um, what, what, what in, the, in, the, in the hipster software as a service uh, world is called a bootstrapped company. So we set up the company with our own capital and have grown it ever since. Um, and it's not like we would have massive external investors that would allow us to uh, just make investments to with, with no limits whatsoever, but uh, we have been able to grow the company very nicely year over year. And um, the plan is to keep investing into new data sets, into new uh, features, and to essentially build up that platform that we have built up so far um, to service more and more airline industry suppliers and the airlines themselves. And that's what's working out quite well. Amazing. Very interesting. I really respect and uh, like uh, the companies that rely on their own uh, operation and the profit to be able to grow. Yes, uh, uh, raising finance is not bad at all. It helps grow faster. But at the same time, uh, gaining control of the company is very important, I guess. Yeah, you know, I mean, all, 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 th all three of us that run the company and, and that, that essentially own it, we... We look at this as a, as a combination of a hobby turned completely out of proportion and, and some kind of self-fulfillment as well. So we are doing things that we like doing. We don't have any external pressures to do things that we don't like to do. So uh, it's not like I have to, to answer to anyone else, uh, outside the company that would be mad if I don't hit some, some quarterly growth target that I have to hit. So... <clears throat> If it takes if it takes a bit longer, it takes a bit longer. It's not it's not really the same as as if you're running a, a company that is owned by private equity or the, where you have external investors that want to see thirty two point four seven percent growth on average. Otherwise, they start yelling at you. So it, it, it's a completely different outlook on life. And because we have a very long term horizon and and don't plan to do anything else for the foreseeable future. Um, all three of us really have this outlook on life that um, we just want to grow at our speed uh, and do what we can and uh, do it the way we want to do it. And if there is if there are things we are not interested in, we're just not doing them. It's very That's beautiful. That's the way we run we run things, and it's very different to any other company I've ever been involved in in the past. There there was always external pressures, but external pressures don't exist here. Actually, it's very beautiful life. It's very beautiful for anyone to work in something on a project they really love, they have passion for, but at the same time, it's not easy. You just mentioned that it takes, it needs patience, it needs resistance, because when you are working on something you love, 
and but you still don't make money uh, from you on the journey there will be opportunities that makes you money but mm-hmm. you're not making money so it takes a lot of strong character and patience to keep doing what you love and what you are doing and resist what might make you money on the short term so what's your, I, I, you are a great example of that you stick to that and you could really make it happen no and i think it's it's quite important that you know what you know what you want and what direction you want to head in and that you are also saying no to people um when they would like you to do something else so it's it's obviously never the best thing to say no to your customers but there are things that our customers would like us to do that i think are are not something that we are interested in or that make then make commercial sense for us in the long run so i mean of course i could start uh helping individual customers doing consultancy style work which would be great in the short term but it doesn't help us in the lo- in the long run so we really 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 focused on what uh our long term strategy is and um we're trying not to deviate that from that unless there is something that somehow fits that plan so i think if you are working the way we do um it's just very critical that you remain laser focused on where you want to be in five years from now and you just execute that step by step by step um instead of just running after whatever the the, the, the quickest buck is that you can make um, and i think that that's why we have been able to get to where we are today because we've just been very very systematic with our approach with what is going to get done in what order and it's going to get done at our speed and if we are too slow to to gain uh, a big customer we, we could have gained if we would have stopped doing everything else then so be it but we are just following uh, our plan and implement it step How much time it took you to make money out of CH aviation and to break even? Um well I mean that is a that is a difficult question because it depends on what your definition of making money out of CH aviation is. Um we making I, a living I, at least. I, 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 <laughs> at least making a living out of it. <clears throat> well I I quit uh the Emirates airline IT subsidiary I was working for Mercator in 2011 and i think i started paying myself a salary in 2014 so for for three years essentially i i and my colleagues at the time versus working for the company for free and we started to have employees that we were paying but we were still working for the company for free. so it, it took a couple of years to actually get to the point where we could live off it very interesting looking at ch aviation and the trying to analyze uh, the business model myself i see la- that you are following the freemium business model where you offer mm-hmm. information for free mm-hmm. on the basic level and then the customers the clients they have to subscribe to gain access to more premium and more detailed analysis and information and it's well known in the business world that any company that's based on the subscription business model it's much more valuable sometimes three times up to 10 times more valuable than that, than a company that work on a transactional business model which have to sell the customer again and again each time so did you build the business on purpose to be following that business model um no, that that would be a lie i mean in general the entire business the entire if i would if i would publicly show you the first business plan we did for the aviation uh that would be uh, hilarious and i have done i've done that some years ago where um i think we when we reached around 30 people at one of the christmas parties i just say look here is the initial business plan we did for cs aviation the business plan for cs aviation was back then it was a different group of people that founded it but the, the four of us that founded it essentially thought okay that is how we're going to make this a paid hobby instead of a hobby mm-hmm. and then it just happened so if i would say we intentionally built this up as a data as a service type business model that the answer is no we didn't um we we didn't expect that we were going to be as successful as we were so we didn't build it like this in, a, in initially uh and intentionally but in a sense we we did because we we went with the subscription model at the beginning but i didn't read a single software as a service book until 
years into doing this. So um, we, we unintentionally got some things right and we got some things wrong. But you know, the company valuation doesn't really matter because we are not planning to sell the company. So um, it's a very theoretical value of what the company would be worth if we would decide to sell it. But it's not really something that is a topic that we are interested in. We're really focused on what we want to build and into, in, into maintaining the growth rate that we want to maintain and uh, implementing the new things that we want to implement, getting into the mar new markets we want to get in. Uh, but it, 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 yeah, I'm not sitting here thinking how what what impact does this decision have on the company. I fully respect that you built a very great business, and I completely understand how important and how dear it is to you, and that you just want to continue building it and growing it, and you you don't really care how much the price would be in case someone wanted to, to sell it because I understand your position. I would be in the same position. Yeah, it's just it's just not something that, that any of us is, is, is really interested in. And I mean, it's, it, 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 yeah, the, all of these businesses that run a business model like ourselves are um, quite interesting from an investment perspective because there's very predictable revenue and it, it's something that we get offered money for all the time, but if someone watches this podcast, the answer is no. <laughs> I'm going to share it with everyone. Guys, don't approach Thomas. He will not sell. <laughs> so look, uh, at the same time, your business is a big proof that data is very valuable. People are willing to pay money just to gain access to valuable, premium, verified data. You have built a business with tens of employees available uh, in many countries around the world. What's your experience with that? Did you feel resistance from the airline industry in paying money for this data? Did, do, do you feel some, some clients, some airlines prefer to dig for this data in-house rather than paying for it? Yeah, there's there certainly always companies that, that, that think that they don't need the type of data that we have. And, and, and quite arguably, there is probably, probably quite a few companies that don't need the type of data that we have. So I mean, that's obviously something that we spend a lot of time on internally because it, we need to make sure we run after the right potential prospects for the type of data and information that we are selling. And if you, I don't know, if you, if you build an, an airline IT product that really only makes sense for the biggest 50 airlines in the world, every idiot can probably figure out who the biggest 50 airlines in the world are and figure out a strategy on how to approach them. I think it, it's, it, it, it really becomes of relevance when you have a very broad target market in the airline industry, or if you have a very broad interest in the airline industry, and then it's very difficult to maintain that by yourself. And in a sense, we are just selling people time, because if you would hire, if you would hire uh, 40 people and spend a couple of years figuring out how to do this type of research, you probably get to the same information that you need. And probably for your business, you don't need everything that I do. But essentially what we do is you're selling people time because they will be able to get the, to, to get the answers to their questions really fast as opposed to having to first do all of the research themselves. And that's essentially what we're what we're selling. So you could almost argue that we are not a, a data as a service or information as a service provider, but a time as a service provider, because we, we help you get to what you need to get answered fast. That's, that's the end of the day what, we're, what, it's, what it's all about. It's very interesting approach, actually, and it's the right one, because if I am an airline, I would focus my time on choosing the right routes rather than digging for data. I get the data from you and I will go just implement the data to reach profitability and to launch successful routes. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it always depends, you know, what type of business you are and, and, and what, type of, what type of data you need. That's why, that's why I said at the beginning, um, I think there is a, there's a big difference in, in, in how valuable or how important it is for you as a business to buy data from an external service provider. And it depends on what the research questions are that you actually have to answer on a regular basis. 
or, 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 or what reports you have to produce to show to investors, to show to external parties, what your total addressable market is, what uh, transactions are happening in the market with other companies and what percentage of the market you have right now and, and things like that. So I think it depends on, on what the business case is on the customer side as well on whether it makes sense for them to subscribe. And there's, there's probably tens of thousands of airline industry suppliers out there and there's quite a big share of them that will probably never become my customers and that's, that's okay. But there's a lot of companies that... Um, obviously have this type of data requirements and where yeah, spending a bit of money on that data is probably an afterthought if you look at the bigger picture of what they are trying to achieve on a day-to-day basis. I agree. I understand. I agree. Following you on social media, I see you very active, talking to people, commenting, uh, liking. At the same time, I know that you really take care of your business you travel yourself you talk to all customers we are one of the customers you're always hands-on so what's your management style are you someone who's involved in every detail in the day-to-day operation or you act as just someone who have the vision put the guidelines and the team will implement it how did you grow ch aviation to where it is today well i think one thing that is that is probably remarkable about CS Aviation is that uh, Max, my chief commercial officer and myself, have really been around since we started doing this commercially. And then on the, on day one, when we started doing this commercially, we were doing everything by ourselves. So um, I have written the news articles for myself. I maintained the fleet data by myself. I maintained the airline data by myself. I was the one writing the specs on what has to be developed, et cetera, et cetera. And we have just blown it up from there. So that helps me having a, a pretty deep understanding of what everyone in the company is doing because I've kind of done everyone else's job when it was still a very, very small job. Um, but I... I wouldn't say that I'm very involved in details. I mean, my team will probably disagree in the sense that I am probably their most annoying customer because I, am, I, I create the most support tickets on what is wrong and what I find in the database and needs to be fixed and where there is a comma missing in a news article that I've read and stuff like that. But besides that, I, I am really just trying to focus on, on getting the subsidies initiatives implemented and it, I'm a big believer that if you put the right people in the right positions, you don't need to deal with that and in, in a sense or, or deal with the details anymore. And in a sense, uh, I'm, I might have an opinion on, on why something should be done a different way than it's being done in sales. But in the end of the day, if they deliver the results they're delivering, uh, and they have a different opinion, then so be it. I mean, I don't need to be involved in every little detail um, as long as the bigger um, picture is moving in the right direction. But I, I specifically, since you since you mentioned me being very active on 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 social media like LinkedIn, I specifically just put time aside uh, for different things I want to focus on, and then I will spend my thirty minutes working on uh, my social media activities. And then once these 30 minutes are over, then it's also it, then I'm going to move on to the next thing that is more important. So uh, I think a lot of it is it's just a question of you deciding what you want to spend time on and then focusing on, on just one thing at a time. And that's what I'm trying to do every, every single day. And that way I actually do have time for things like that. I'm sure you're doing that very well. The results speak about itself. One last question before we close. It was very valuable session, a lot of uh, great interesting insights and information. If you would give one advice to the aviapreneurs willing to start a new successful aviation businesses, an advice you wish you could have learned it when you started, what would it be? I think that you need to be really, really systematic about who you assume your addressable target market is and then how you're going to approach them and how you're going to work through that. And I mean, that's something that data can actually help you with. So if you're starting from a white sheet of paper and you're trying to implement a new business, no matter what it is, try to figure out what the best data 
source this, be it CH aviation, be it someone else, because it depends on what exactly you're planning to do. And then try to be incredibly systematic about figuring out how you're going to approach your addressable target market. Because there is one thing that is a big luxury if you're in the airline industry, I think. It's very hard to hide an airline. So if your targets, if your targets are airlines, it's very hard to hide them. So it's very easy to find them. Therefore, it's very easy to build logical strategies on how you're going to start penetrating them and start getting customers. And in all of the companies I worked for in the past, I always had the feeling that there was not enough system and too much coincidence behind how we were approaching customers. And if you are selling in a market into a market like the airline industry, where every single player is known, this is so much easier than if you are, I don't, I mean, I have, I have friends that are running software as a service companies that do very broad things like uh, HR uh, related software. You can sell that to millions of customers and it's really hard to create proper target lists of who you're running after. But if you're, if you're in the airline industry, it's actually something that is really, really easy to do because you can't hide that you run the fact that you're running an airline so it, it, it's relatively easy in that market to be properly focus on on how you're doing your sales and marketing activities and a lot of companies are failing at that i think that's that's one key piece of advice that i learned myself having been involved in selling airline it systems to the industry before but i think if you're very systematic about it you can be a lot faster than if you're just running after the quickest opportunity as you said before Thank you, Thomas. I really appreciate yeah. this valuable advice. It was a great pleasure to, to you today. And I appreciate all the information and the experience and the stories shared with us. I look forward to seeing you in person in one of the exhibitions or here in Dubai very soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, fellow aviapreneurs. Thank you for everyone who's watching us and listening to us today. It was a great session with Mr. Thomas Yeager. I look forward to seeing you again next week. We're going to have another aviapreneur who spent all of his life in the airline industry and who will share with us great experience, information and the stories. Stay tuned. See you next week. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.